Welcome, welcome everybody to the Yelp for Restaurants Industry Town Hall. I am so pleased to introduce restaurateur and hospitality pioneer, Ari Winesworth. Why do I call him a pioneer? Ari and his team scaled a simple deli into a national brand, vertically integrating and creating a family of brands along the way. He pioneered the culture first movement in our industry, transforming hourly employees into equity partners. On top of that, he's a published author and in his spare time, as if there is such a thing, He's been a content creator for decades now. Today, we're gonna to unpack what it took to evolve a deli into a $50 million empire and where Ari believes the industry is headed next. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Josh Kopel. I'm a mission rated restaurateur and I've spent the last 19 months talking about running restaurants instead of running them myself. And I've done this with a singular goal in mind, to figure out if there's a recipe for guaranteed success in our industry. I also host Full Comp, a podcast that airs twice weekly, unpacking the tools, tactics, and strategies of our industry's greatest leaders. It's a completely selfish endeavor. I have the privilege of talking to the folks I idolize, and I only ask the questions I want to ask. But the town hall is your turn. Today, Ari answers the questions that you've asked, and I encourage you to use the Q&A and chat functions throughout our conversation if there's anything you want to dig deeper on. We're also leaving time for live Q&A at the end of the town hall. With that being said, welcome, Ari. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Josh. Glad to be here. So we'll roll right into the questions, guys, because we have a ton stacked. Let's do it. So the first question is, is about culture. So you established your, your initial restaurant and built it around a set of core values, more so than even a set of products and those core values have evolved over time and you've been doing this long enough now that I think you're able to extrapolate out the benefits that you've received your team your patrons from creating what is now called a statement of beliefs yeah well I mean it's 40 years down the road so it's not like it was what we started with although in hindsight I would have started with it if I knew enough to do that so I guess if you're listening and you're new you could do it you don't have to wait 40 years um so we also have guiding principles uh so we opened the deli in 1982 just me and Paul and two employees uh and we're actually close to 70 million now so uh although we dropped to 50 during the pandemic and then we've gradually worked our way back up through the insane. It's a hard knock life. <laughs> it was hard enough before. The, like it wasn't easy before all this. Now it's like really crazy. But anyway, um, so we wrote our guiding principles in 1991. So we had already been in business for uh, whatever that is, nine years. Um, again, I wish I would have done it sooner. It's just, you know, when you start, as many people listening probably have. I mean, you got me and Paul and two employees, like whatever, like you're standing right next to each other. <laughs> if you didn't share a lot of values, you would never have gone into business together. Um, and the employees are so close to you that if they go awry, you literally can grab them by the shirt sleeve politely and pull them back to where they need to be. So, but in, in a good way, as, as one grows, then there's more and more people working and what was obvious to me and Paul was turned out to not be obvious to hardly anybody else. And of course, uh, we started to realize that the problem wasn't them. The problem was us, uh, because if you're not clear on what you really want, it's very hard to get it. Uh, if you're from a nice dysfunctional family like I am, uh, then you get good at guessing, but it's really a million times easier to just tell people and then they don't have to guess. So the guiding principles were an attempt, as many people will be familiar with already, I, th I think that's less of a radical thing right now, but to, to put our, our values, our ethics down on paper where we could start to teach them and uh, provide some ethical framework for all of us, me, Paul, and everybody else. By that point, there was 150 people working or so uh, to make better decisions. So absolutely, it's very important absolutely it was already in line with what we kind of intuitively for us started with but uh, certainly an important thing the statement of beliefs came way farther down the road so we just rolled it out last spring so it's been six months after two years probably working on it uh, and that came the idea of it or the need for it came to my mind uh, mm, 
six years ago, maybe when I was working on the power of beliefs in business, part four of the Zingerman's Guide to Good Leading series that, uh, that I wrote. And I had really never thought about beliefs. I mean, this sounds weird because as you know, I mean, I was already writing and teaching and with Zing Train and speaking on leadership and all kinds of stuff, but I really had never thought about the idea of beliefs. So when I talk about beliefs here, just for clarity, I'm not really getting into religion, sports, and politics. Those are also areas of beliefs, but that's what kind of dominates like 85% of the conversation, but it's actually about 2% of what matters. Um, I'm talking about beliefs about employees, beliefs about work, beliefs about how many hours is, are too many hours, beliefs about attire. Uh, I still remember actually laughing, I'll say it on this talk, is when I, I was running kitchens, this is before we opened the deli, I uh, had moved up from dishwasher to kitchen manager over like three or four years, and uh, they told me if I didn't take my earring out, I would never uh, be able to run a dining room, and so, <laughs> but I, I mean now, like, you know, it's like, face tattoos might be pushing it some places but other i mean so it's just those are beliefs right i mean there's no ethical thing about earrings face tattoos or anything else it's just beliefs that we hold so anyway i stumbled on the idea of beliefs in a book by bob and judith wright called transform uh, i've known bob for a long time he wrote the foreword for uh, part three of the book on managing ourselves and about halfway through the book i stumbled on this little self-fulfilling belief cycle which you have there uh, in your copy of the statement of beliefs. Um, and it, it blew my mind because it just like opened this entire area of study and of, of observation and learning that I had just given zero thought to. Uh, but essentially it showed me that we all have beliefs. We got beliefs, like I said, about everything, about what good food should cost, about a cup of coffee, about everything. And what we do, in other words, all our actions follow what we believe. So other than an instinctive response, like if somebody throws a rock at you, you're gonna just duck without giving any thought, but really all our actions, including people signing up for this uh, session, including people like me listening to your podcast regularly in the belief we're gonna learn from other people. I mean, just the belief you're gonna learn from other people is already a belief, right? So. Our actions are follow our beliefs. The people around us are influenced by our actions. They in turn form their own beliefs and then they take action, right? It's a cycle. And what blew my mind from Bob and Judith Wright's work was that 95% of the time their action will reinforce our original beliefs. So let me just illustrate that for you. If you have a trainer on shift in the restaurant and they're training a trainee and for whatever reason, they don't like the trainee or they believe the trainee should never have been hired or they have unconscious or conscious bias, whatever it might be. That belief will lead them to treat the trainee strangely. The trainee will start to feel like it's not a great place for them to work because they feel yeah. so uncomfortable and they don't feel very welcomed. Even if the words have never been said, the energy is being passed clearly through the interaction then the trainee who's now hesitant, awkward, and doubting themselves for taking the job doesn't do great work because, duh, they don't feel comfortable. And then the train trainer says, yeah, look at, I knew they were no good. Now, I'm not saying just the trainer believing in the trainee guarantees success, but I can tell you that not believing in them almost guarantees failure. Uh, and then the other piece to this is that there's a little filter that we all have in science. They call it confirmation bias. And essentially we all filter out the information that doesn't fit our beliefs and we take in or if we're proactive we seek out the information that will support our beliefs if you doubted this just look at the news over the last two or three years it will reinforce exactly this because people read the same news story and arrive at 180 degree opposite conclusions so anyway this statement of this belief cycle blew my mind and i started studying and studying and it turned into a like 600 page book which you have the statement of beliefs came beyond that because after the book came out, I started to realize that we had not clarified our expectations around beliefs. And I started to realize, although our ethics were clear, there were a lot of other beliefs that were not clear. We kind of expected them, but only in the way that a dysfunctional family expects them. Like you should just know that asking for help is good. 
at Zingerman's, even though the whole rest of society and maybe your family tells you asking for help is a sign of weakness, right? So uh, this led me to start a lot of conversations and push through the inevitable early resistance. And then we've ended up with this booklet. This is a long answer to your question, but it's the statement of belief. So what we're saying in this, there's, a, there's two pages of beliefs. Uh, these are the beliefs that we work with here. They're not really about ethics, but they're about how we work together. If you want to work here, these are in essence in the restaurant world, these are the equivalent of the intellectual ingredients that we will use for decision making. Right. So the first one on the list says we start with positive beliefs. So I'm not telling you what to do out of work. When you go home, you can be as negative as you want. It's zero business of mine, <laughs> no value judgment on you as a human being. But when we're here, if your manager forgot to answer your email, I understand your immediate reaction might be he's a jerk, but how about we come up with some positive stories? And some people really have a hard time coming up with positive stories because they've been so trained by the rest of the world. But a positive story could be he missed the email. I don't know about you. It's happened to me. No, for Another sure. one could be he's being really thoughtful and he wants to put a little more time into his response. Uh, another one could be uh, he he is thought that he had answered and it got stuck in his drafts. I don't know if that's ever happened. So there's a hundred positive stories. There's a hundred negative stories, but the story we tell will alter the entire uh, outcome of it. So these are basically the intellectual ingredients. And I just compare it to like at the Roadhouse, Zingerman's Roadhouse, where we make a lot of macaroni and cheese. Uh, we use Martelli pasta from Tuscany. It's one of the few non-American things that we use out there, but it's just so great. And I'm like, every line cook we hire is mother made macaroni and cheese. I mean, but we don't let them bring in their mother's pot macaroni. I grew up on craft. We don't let them bring in their mother's macaroni and follow the recipe with that macaroni because the quality of the dish will be <laughs> unservable. So these are the intellectual ingredients that we're going to use. So that's really what the statement of beliefs is. Uh, we're not judging people for not following it out of work, but at work, this is what we're going to do. And it's having an impact. I'll tell you why I started here and why I thought it was so important to start here. Because if 20-year-old me, 20-year or I guess 30-year-old restaurateur me was listening to you, and I signed up for this thing to learn how to build a $70 million empire, I would be waiting for you to finish so that we can get to the stuff that actually helped you create a $70 million empire, but this is it. This is the stuff that did it. At the end of the day, I believe that for myself and for so many of us out there, most restaurant owners are great restaurant managers and mediocre to terrible restaurant owners. And it's because we're busy managing. We're not busy owning. And the only way you're gonna get from zero to $70 million is with vision. And you have spent a lot of time working on yourself, working on your company, but also working on the vision you have yeah. for yourself and your company. Yeah. What's the question? There is no question. I just wanted no. to reiterate why I thought it was so important. <laughs> we started here to be it, a live it, event. It, it is. Uh, I, as you know, I mean, I've, I've been working for quite a while now, and this, uh, which is turning into the next book, but this metaphor of, of organization as ecosystem, right? And it actually started with the beliefs because I started to think about our beliefs as the root system of our lives. Uh, we really don't see them for the most part, but even if you're not a farmer, it's kind of obvious that whatever comes up above the surface is always 100% correlated to the root system. And if you're 40 years old and your mother taught you something that when you were an infant, you have 40 years of roots growing and they're not going to come out real quick. Right. And so beliefs can be anything from uh, about the value of a cup of coffee. I mean, people who obviously we have our own coffee roasting. I drink good coffee. I'm happy to pay for coffee. I won't drink bad coffee. I'd rather go without, but people who drink McDonald's coffee think is perfectly fine and are confident that Zingerman's is ripping them off for whatever we charge for a cup of, of siphon brewed Costa Rica uh, dry process or natural process reserve, you know, so th this is going on all day long. So anyways, the ecosystem helps me to understand that all of these things are important. The food is super important. The service is super important. 
and the hope level is important and the cultural soil is important and the beliefs are important. Just like in farming, like no farmer goes like, what's the one thing you have to do? It doesn't make any sense in farming. It's a ludicrous question, but you start to understand it's how all these pieces come together. And yes, vision is a huge piece of it. And as I look at it in the ecosystem, the vision is the one piece that's not really of nature. It's what you and I as humans create in nature. Uh, and, and to state the almost obvious, it needs in my mind to be very uh, harmonious, compatible, appropriate for the ecosystem in which you're building it. So the opposite of what we do, uh, and probably most of the people listening, because it's your audience, uh, would be like Best Buy or, you know, no, no cut on, on franchises, but it's like Wendell Berry says, it's like a cookie cutter on dough. So if you go to uh, Best Buy in Anchorage, Alaska, it probably looks pretty much identical to the one in Ann Arbor. And if I just blindfolded you drugged you and woke you up inside you'd have zero way to know where you were right and so the idea for me is to really create a vision that's appropriate for the ecosystem in the same way that a farmer in, in a regenerative farming setting would always grow what's appropriate for the ecosystem in which they're farming the principles remain similar in every climate but actually what they grow is very different but it evolves, right? Like it's you're 40 years into this and, and you've created this timeless brand that is as legacy driven as it is up to date and current. And Lord knows our, our industry and the values of the people we serve have changed dramatically over the last 40 years. How have you managed to stay relevant in a national presence as a brand for the last 40 years? Well, I don't know if we're timeless because it's impossible to judge because <laughs> that would have to keep going for a lot longer, but um, till the end of time. Um, <laughs> there's an essay in part one of the book, which is called Building a Better Business, Building a Great Business, uh, that's called 12 Natural Laws of Business, which you're familiar with. Uh, it is my belief that all healthy organizations, whether it's a restaurant, a basketball team, a bank, a church, uh, a brownie troop, a family, for that matter, a university philosophy department, doesn't matter. If they're living in a healthy way, they're living in harmony with those natural laws. And I, so I don't take any credit for making them up anymore <laughs> than Columbus discovered America or that Newton discovered gravity. I mean, it's just what was there. We just stumble into it over time. I, I having focused on them for the last 15 years, I will tell you that I hear the same themes come up from great athletes. I hear the same themes come up from great musicians. I hear the same themes come up from people who are doing great in the food business, in everything, in parenting, in, in teaching. Uh, one, one of them is uh, that we do all the little things that everybody else knows that you should do, but don't feel like doing. Right. So in our right. world, you go back and taste for salt one more time. You go back to the table one more time when you've been there a million hours and you really want to go home. You, you go back to thank the dishwasher one more time. I mean, and I just was talking to a teacher yesterday. Uh, he's a high school teacher about a small town about an hour from here, but he uses this, that book as a textbook for his high school entrepreneurship class. And uh, I called him and he's like, I only got a minute. Can I talk to you later? So yeah, I'll call you when I'm leaving the roadhouse at nine o'clock. I'm driving home. I'll call you. So he's like, yeah, I, I, I'm one of the only teachers still that just does all these parent teacher conferences and like hardly anybody else will do them. And I'm like, there you go. It's a natural law. It's part of why you're a great teacher. So vision is on the list. Uh, there's, there's 10 other ones, but I, I think the answer to your question is if, if, if we do those 12 things well over time, with a little bit of good fortune, then we're gonna stay relatively healthy, right? Another one of them is you need to keep improving all the time. So if we were, if we, I mean, I know that our customers from 1982 think it was, everything was better then, but it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, the bread is better. The way we handle the corned beef is better. The way we work is better, but you know, we all attach to nostalgia in, in a way that can't be undone. 
but from a, a, a object, more objective, there's no real objective, but from a more objective standpoint from you and I, let's say as food professionals, there's no question that what we do is better. We're now using a naturally fermented sauerkraut. I mean, it's all these things that we've raised the bar on, right? So I, I think that's the direct answer is live in harmony with those 12 natural laws. And because one of them is to always improve, then if you start taking it for granted, you're in trouble. And that's true in music, it's true in the food business. And for everybody listening, we're going to be sending out links to everything that, that Ari references in this uh, in this town hall. So don't worry about that. Um, let's talk about product market fit. Uh, you know, I, I think that as an independent restaurateur, it's incredibly important. Uh, recently, I, I, I've been advocating for, you know, most restaurateurs think they have a marketing problem when they probably have a product market fit problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, you found a great product market fit uh, on a local level, but then you managed to do that nationally. And, and so the question is, wh what is the process through which you determine if what you're going to, to put out there is something that people authentically want? Well, I don't know if this is a good answer, but we just start with what we believe in. <laughs> uh, I would suggest and I, I i'm pretty confident people could make a lot more money the other way but I, that's not the driving force for, i don't mean money is unimportant but the, the challenge wasn't let's open a restaurant to see how much money we can make <laughs> would have been a bad move it was let's open a restaurant let's open a deli because we think we could do something really special and we love the food and we want to work in a really cool way and let's create meaningful work for ourselves and everybody else that we're working with and that means paying the bills at the business and paying our bills and i'm all for money but it's never really got me up in the morning excited i get i have anxiety when the numbers look bad but i don't really go into joy-filled uh euphoria when the numbers look good it's fun for about five minutes and then i'm right back to the salt wasn't right in, <laughs> in the mashed potatoes or whatever so uh i i i guess we start with what we believe Going back to the values or guiding principles, we defined quality uh, 30 years ago. So for us, that gives, again, the frame of what we work with. So it's two, com two components here at Zingerman's, again, not to judge others, but for us, high quality, which is a subjective word, by the way, which I wouldn't have known what that is, but it means it has no meaning unless you define it. For us, quality means full flavor. And we define that as complexity, balance, and finish turns out to be a good life metaphor also and the second <laughs> is is traditional food so i'm a history major i'm biased towards history uh but i really believe that we cannot do justice to the food cooking it selling it preparing it or eating it if we don't know its story in the same way that managing an employee without knowing who they are i don't mean i have to know every intricacy of their personal life but to not know that they have three kids to not know that their mother is in hospice to not know what their passions are i mean it, it just doesn't make sense so studying the food so for us those two components drive the decision right so uh i mean i'm in a conversation these are never done these conversations right so there's an ingredient that we buy that's quite costly uh there's about 600 alternatives that are less expensive less uh, i've banned the word supply chain for my conversation but are less difficult to get uh and there's lots of logical reasons to get rid of the what we have but in a, in a good way i'm like i'm glad you're asking because these are the right questions to ask is it worth the work is it worth but i just like once you start down that road it's <laughs> you're here then you go here and then you know what there's another one that's just like right there and then there's one more that's right there and there's one more that's right there and the, in the short term, the profitability might look better, but in the long run, you're undercutting your values. And then it's hard. You don't really believe in the product. And if I know I can go get it better, why do I even want to sell it? And if I don't want to sell it, why would the server want to sell it at the table? Why would the cook want to cook it? Right. And then to the end point, why would the customer even want to buy, buy it? Right. So for me, it really starts with what we believe in. I, is there some intuitive sense? Absolutely. But that's, I what, I'm that, yeah, that's there, what I'm there picking is, up. Yeah, there is. That's what I'm picking up is that, that it's this organic process because you are tuned into the team and the community and your vendors and 
being plugged in probably makes it a lot easier to intuit what people yeah. want. But I'm not trying to guess what they want. I'm trying to guess, I'm trying to sell what I believe in that they don't know they want. Is that harder? So this is, it's more fun. <laughs> Everything good, everything's hard. I don't think there's any easy way, but I, it's not intuitive, like pulling stuff out of the air. I mean, the pattern is clear. And I think I, I would suggest there's, I'm not the only one who does it. I mean, there's now dozens of people here who are doing it because they're trained in the, the overt expectations. And then we taste it together a lot. And so, and we talk it through, I, I will suggest that that belief cycle is huge because if you don't believe in the product, your energy, your action will all undercut the effectiveness of how the product sells. We know this. I mean, there's nobody who has a restaurant that doesn't know uh, what the server's going to do at the table. I'm just laughing about the guy from Huddy Bistro, the Instagram thing. Uh, <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, he does extremely good takeoffs on like the server when they don't like when the customer said the, the, the guest says like, well, how's that? And he goes, uh, it's uh, interesting. And then he's like the next one, um, it, it's good. You know, like <laughs> all the ways that you can answer without saying it's bad, but make obviously right. no one to buy it. So right. I, I mean, the beliefs do drive it. And, and if I believe in something deeply in the same way that a musician believes in his or her music or that a social change agent believes in social justice and they're gonna drive, they're not gonna give up the first time somebody rolls their eyes at them. They're going to keep going. So the vision helps with that because you see the end, you have the end in mind. The beliefs help because it's not just a tactical tool. It's not like somebody told us this was the formula. Let's follow it, it, it which, which is akin, I would suggest, to living out the life that your mother and father wanted you to live, which may overlap with yours, but it's a very hollow way to live that ends up almost inevitably in a midlife crisis and we probably get the midlife crisis in any way, but, but anyway, <laughs> just so I, I think the belief piece is huge. So knowing what your values are, believing in it and then working on your palate. I mean, because everybody on here knows, I mean, there, there are enormous differences from properly salted. Uh, I mean, salt level just tasted some of these bread last night that they're trying hard, but it's just, like the salt's not right. And it just completely alters the experience of the bread. Which beliefs do you think have most impacted the success that you've reached? You have a bunch of beliefs, but yeah. are there, are there linchpins? Is, is there one that is foundational that the rest rest on? Well, as you know, I studied anarchism and I have returned to it more and more deeply over the last 15 years. And uh, one of the best things I learned from anarchist philosophy, which is anarchism is essentially a belief system. And uh, Gustav Landauer, who no one out here will likely have heard of, was a fascinating and inspiring German uh, Jewish anarchist from the early 20th century who was a, a pacifist, but was actually kicked to death by the German army in 1919. But anyway, he's among many other insightful things he said. And he said, this is something that blew my mind and gave me much deeper insight into anarchism as a philosophy said, we have no political beliefs, we have beliefs against politics. So it's actually the opposite of politics. And it's a belief system about how we treat each other and how we interact with the world, treat how we treat ourselves, etc. So one of the many things I learned from anarchism that's helped me a lot is to stop thinking hierarchically. I don't mean there's no operational hierarchy, right? Like on, in a restaurant, somebody's running the line somebody's expediting, somebody's of managing, course. but, but to believe that the manager is a better person than the person that just got fired, I would suggest is incorrect and problematic to believe that the person who can't quite get their fish sauteed properly is a bad person is a mistake. Right. And, and so this helped me to stop looking for the most important thing and to realize like what going back to the ecosystem metaphor, like in nature, everything matters, right? So if you approach it from an industrial, if one approaches from an industrial mindset of weight being most important, let's say bees would seem like irrelevant and insignificant. I mean, how much could they weigh like out of all of the planet? Like bees are, I don't know, you know, maybe like a tenth of a hundredth of a percent or something, right? But everybody listening knows it's hugely integral to the health of agriculture and, and, and of 
the thriving of fruits, uh, fruit trees, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems insignificant, but this is to understand that it's all interrelated, right? So one of our beliefs is the belief that everybody's a good person that's capable of doing great things. So a commonly held belief in the work world at large, and certainly in the food business, and I just bumped into this one from a someone who I respect a lot and who's got a, quite a successful in many ways business and who is my age and just goes, yeah, it's just, what do you do with these young people? They just don't really want to work. And I'm like, okay, we just went over beliefs. <laughs> 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 and I'm like, we do not have this problem. Like, I mean, I work with 16 year olds who are awesome. Awesome. They're interested. They're busting ass. A couple of them were out with COVID. I'm like, we missed you. They're like, man, I missed being here. I love being here. I'm like, no, I don't mean everything's perfect. And we don't have cynical 16 year olds too, but we got cynical 60 year olds too. So it's, it's not tied to age. Right. But so I, I mean, if I treat the host or the hostess with dignity and they're 17 and they have information and they get treated like an intelligent human and you come into the restaurant and it's your first time there, we know, I mean, like 70% of your judgment of the, of the business is going to be based on that host. So like, if you have Absolutely. high beliefs about Zingerman's high expectations, after you listen to this, you and me going back and forth for an hour and you come in and the host looks the wrong way, or he or she has a pebble in their shoe. So they're looking down and then you go, look, I don't know, this whole thing's overblown. Look at how bad the host, they clearly don't care anymore, you know, and we've all gotten complaint letters that start with something like, clearly no one there cares about quality anymore because this happened. And I'm like, okay, you, we can make any mistake, but you're <laughs> judging our intentions is kind of off base. So I guess the answer to your question is, I think they all matter. What matters most is that they're yours and that you really believe them and that you really do your best to live them every day because of course the incongruity of not living them is soul killing Absolutely. and ineffective. But they all matter. In growing your small town restaurant, not to say that Ann Arbor is a small town, but a smaller town, a medium sized town. You're into in a LA. national. We're, we're like a we're like a small <laughs> neighborhood in the corner. Uh, what are some things you did right? Like in in you know everybody wants to talk about scaling, and I think it's an important conversation to have for two reasons. One, it's where everybody wants to be too. Now might be a great time to do it. And I'll give you a third one. Most great restaurant concepts go out of business when they scale. So yes, what, well, that's because they're farming in Michigan from an office in New York, maybe <laughs> just saying. Right. Uh, well, I mean, everybody gets to decide what they want to do. I, we start with vision. So the visioning, which you referenced earlier before, is as exactly as you said, very important to us. So the vision as we do it is very different than the business school version. I didn't go to the business school, but the typical business vision statement is like four lines. Uh, I can't for the life of me understand the difference between that and a mission statement, even though I've read a lot of books that tell me it's different, but they seem like they're kind of the same. Uh, we like mission statements also. Uh, I wrote about our approach in part one of the book and we wrote it that same time we did the guiding principles back in 1991. So the mission statement for us is like the North star. It answers four questions. What do you do? Why are you doing it? Who are you doing it? And for whom are you doing it? Right. The why is now purpose. People are using that term too, which is fine. So the mission is like the North star. Like when you're having a bad day, which we all have regularly, it helps us to take a deep breath and remember what we're here to do. So like ours, the answer to what we do is, we're here to bring a great Zingerman's experience to everybody that we work with, serve, et cetera. But it doesn't tell you what we're going to actually do. <laughs> right. So we could open 7,000 Zingerman's corned beef huts globally and go public, or we could have never opened anything besides the deli, and they both fit with that mission. The vision is a much more detailed description of the future. It's, an, to your point earlier, it's an inside-out exercise. So it's not what we could do. It's what we want to do. It's not how other people say we should work. It's how we want to work. It's what we believe in. And 
if it's a group, then it's a collaborative conversation to figure out what that is. But once you've described that, then you know where you're going in the ecosystem metaphor. Again, it's the piece that you and I as human beings uh, build. It's basically, it's, it's like the cathedral that we're working to construct. Um, so our vision is 10 pages long for 2032. I mean, it's detailed, right? But uh, it's, it's a description of our future. It's where we're going. We're not going public. We're not selling the company. We're not trying to open more units outside of town. We only open in the Ann Arbor area. We only do everything once. And I'm not judging other people for doing the opposite. It's just, this is what means, this is what we want to do. And the inverse is what most of the world does and i'm not judging it's what we used to do too you just react to every opportunity and problem as it arises but i would suggest it's sort of like taking a long trip but you don't know where you're going so every time you get to an intersection you got to stop and argue over which way looks better it, if you know where if you know where you're going to end up it's merely tactical so if we made one wrong turn whatever we're going to get back on course I, I think it's a massive lesson. I, I was talking to somebody last night and they said, you know, what do restaurateurs need right now? I said, first, money. Money would be nice. Second, yeah. labor. Labor would be helpful. Um, but third, and not necessarily in this order, is a plan. You know, I, I, I think back to, to our first conversation and Lord knows, I mean, I, I followed you for years, but when your business partner came to you and decided that you, know, you guys needed to scale and you agreed to do so. The first thing you did, maybe not the first thing, but one of the first things you did was come up with a plan. Yeah, so he, it's not like he said we needed to scale. We don't, we never used that word actually, although many people I know do, but he, so, so natural law number one on the list. And by the way, I'm gonna, my email is just ari at zingermans.com. So whatever things we don't get to, people can just email me also and then, uh, I can try to answer those questions that come to your mind. Anyway, when we opened the deli, we did not write down a vision the way that we now do it, of course. But like everybody who gets to greatness, and again, I don't mean the most money necessarily, if, although that could be what how you define greatness, but however you define it, uh, we had a vision in our heads. We just didn't write it down, right? And um, essentially, we knew from the beginning we wanted something really special. Uh, I've since written a little pamphlet called The Art of Business, which is about my belief that business and life are like art or music. And in the same way that I'm drawn to the musicians whose music is the most special and true to who they are, and you can feel it in, in the vibration of the music. And the artists are the ones who do something special. It's not the ones who make the most commercial art. I'm not judging them, but that's not who I'm drawn to, right? So uh, that was what we wanted in, in food. I mean, I couldn't have philosophically explained it as well as I can all these years later, but in essence, that's what we wanted. We knew we wanted great food, great service, great place for people to work uh, from the beginning in a really down to earth setting where you could have what's still going on uh, now, which is whatever big CEO at one table and a high school kid at the next table. And I love that. And, and we, we knew from the get go, we only wanted one. My experience of the food business is the best places that I remember for decades are always where there's one. I have never gotten, and I'm not judging, I've just never gone to the <laughs> fifth one and gone like, man, this is incredible. It's way more convenient <laughs> if you live in the suburbs, but it's never has the feel of the first place. And so that's what I wanted. And, and, and then Paul sat me down in 1993 in the summer. So we were 12 years in business and he kind of looked at, you know, I, I needed to be inside getting the sandwich line set up for the lunch rush. And he kind of looks at me and he goes like, Okay, in 10 years, what are we doing? I, I have no idea. He's like, no, really, like in 10 years, what are we doing? I'm like, dude, I don't know. And he's like, well, we're, you know, people are, we're, are offering us to open other cities, but we keep turning them down and people are opening on campus because we won't do it. Is this crazy? What are we doing? I'm like, come on, man, I got work to do. We're going to get crushed if I don't get in there and get the line set up. And he's like, this is our work. So in hindsight, I come to realize like he probably couldn't sleep for four months uh, worrying <laughs> about it. And, and in our current language, what he was worrying about, what he was asking is, what's your vision? Uh, I didn't have one. Um, I don't think he really had one either, but what he did have is an intuitive or whatever sense that we had fulfilled that original vision. It's very common. Uh, going back to the cathedral, it's like the cathedral has been 
completed, but the workmen keep coming. So we got to find ways to add it on to keep everybody busy. And mm -hmm. this is what I would suggest happens to a lot of organizations. And it's what would have happened to us had he not asked that question. And we not then spent a year of long walks, lots of swear words and eye rolls mm -hmm. and continually coming back to the table till we figured out for the first time a vision. And that vision we wrote was called Zingerman's 2009 and it's in the back of the first business book. And it, so if you're doing the math, you'll see we went 15 years in the future, not 10. And that's where we describe this community businesses. So it's not like that's the right answer for anybody else. It's just, it came from our hearts and our heads. And it was a collaboration between us to design what we've got. And then we wrote the next one in 07 for 2020. And then uh, recently we finished the 2032. So that's where we're going. And when we get there, it'll be 50 years in business. So we little crazy. That's a big number, huh? In, in, well, if you're in natural forestry, it's nothing. But if you're in the food <laughs> business, if you're in the food business, it's almost a miracle. <laughs> Well, let's look back on the, those early days. Somebody asked, and I mean, I, I've been here myself, so I thought it was a super pertinent question. Uh, do you ever, did you ever have that moment when you almost didn't make payroll? And, and how did I'm you sure, deal I'm with that I'm sure moment? we have. Uh, well, Paul always says that he, like when we were working, you mentioned ownership. So we actually have, I don't know what the number is, 18 managing partners. So there's a managing partner in each business. And then we also have uh, just under 200 of the 700 people who work here own a share in the organization, right? And that's a program that's six years old, I think. So, and we're working on more staff ownership to come up with for the future. Anyway, Paul always says the difference between, he's like, I want people with real ownership and people go like, we yeah, have, but the accountants go like, yeah, you can give them like, stock appreciation rights and you know like they don't and it's like no i want real ownership not a sense of ownership <laughs> a sense of ownership is like when there's not enough money to make payroll the employee goes the the faux partner goes yeah i feel bad for ari and paul i wonder what they're gonna do the real partner <laughs> the real partner picks up the phone and starts calling every cousin you can imagine to borrow five thousand dollars and you know and we've been there i mean i i remember I don't, I, I can't say it was exactly for payroll, but I do have this memory of this friend. It was a better friend of his, but friend of both of us who, super nice guy owned a Chinese restaurant. Uh, this is many years ago in town, super nice guy. And Paul called him and he's like, I need to borrow money. And so he goes, okay, I'm going to lend you the money. So he comes and he's like, Paul, Paul's like, I'm working, you know, we're working. He's like, no, Paul, we go outside. And he's got his car out there he reaches in the car and he hands Paul this big brown paper bag. <laughs> <laughs> and it had a lot of money in it. We ended up paying him back, you know, but, but anyway, so, you know, it's, I, I, I just said this this morning, actually, during uh, the appreciations that we end every meeting with, um, we have a financial person, upper level person who's moving on to go to an accounting firm. He's been here for five years and he's, he led all the work on the PPP loans, you know, which saved our butts and many other people's. We can get into the restaurant replenishment fund and the IRC and all that if you want. But, but anyway, uh, you know, the first six weeks or whatever of the pandemic, I mean, you know, we're fairly reasonably financially healthy and we have debt, but it's not excessive debt. It's not easy debt, but it's fairly reasonable, appropriate where we're at except as many people on here will know like all of a sudden your sales drop like to a 23 percent of where they were or whatever and then i'm like okay all of those loans that were personally signed on and then i'm like trying to add up my savings and how does it compare and then what do i do with my house and maybe i should put it in tammy's name so i don't lose that you know and it's not like we live we spend money excessively, but we've used to a standard of living that's reasonable. And all of a sudden I'm thinking like, okay, we're gonna move back into a two bedroom apartment with our five dogs and what are we gonna do? And, you know, it's a, it's a, many people on the call will have been in similar situations, I'm sure. I mean, the public is, has a hard time understanding that. I mean, I remember talking to Rick Bayless early on, we talked pretty regularly uh, and he's like, yeah, 
customers just keep going, you'll be fine. You've been here for all these years. He goes, you have no understanding of what we're dealing with. So, I mean, this is, you know, if, if, if Frontera Grill and all of their organization, which I admire deeply and is very healthy in us, and we're all freaking out in a, in a calm, grounded, resilient way, yeah. freaking yeah, yeah, out. Yeah. Then imagine, you know, I'm like, imagine what it's like if we just opened last year. Yeah. And you're paying on Monday last week's bills with what you took in on Sunday. I mean, it's scary stuff. Man. And the public has a hard time understanding that it can be that challenging, but that's the reality of what we do. Absolutely. I, this is a great time to actually talk about em, em, employee equity as well. How do you empower yeah. your team and your team's leaders to be decisive and reflective? Well, partly beliefs tell you what's decisive and what's thoughtful and reflective, right? So when the beliefs book came out, there's a, I think he just retired, but he was the head of OBGYN at University of Michigan. So we have massive, wonderful, world-class healthcare system here in town in our little tiny town um, that people come to from all over the place. But anyway, he's a big believer in what we do. He's used a lot of the Zing train and systems in the books. And when he's done a lot of work in Ghana, he brings, uh, he brings visiting physicians, not during the pandemic, but brings visiting physicians. And he always like buys them a set of the business books and they sign it for him. And uh, right after the beliefs book came out, a bunch of his uh, residents came into the roadhouse for dinner and we were going to do an event on a book. And one of them asked me, I, I pour water every night at the tables. This is one way you stay connected to the customer. So uh, one of them's like, well, what's, what's the book about? And, you know, maybe we should get it for Dr. Johnson as a gift. And I'm like, that's a great idea. You know, he'd probably really like it. I said, well, let me, I used to live with the orthopedic surgeon, a woman, an orthopedic surgeon for many years. Uh, and she's very good at what she does. So I, I know some of this from listening to her, right? So I'm like, this is, and these are, you know, it's 10 people, eight are women, it's OBGYN. So I said, this is what it is. When you go in the operating room and a guy is the surgeon and he hesitates, they go, oh, he's being very thoughtful. He doesn't want to do the wrong thing. He's just taking a little more time to make the right decision. And I looked at them and I'm like, but if you take another second to think about it, they're like, see, they can't be decisive. Women hesitate too much. They're never going to be good surgeons. <laughs> so the belief alters completely what you're doing. Right. I, I guess, first of all, I would take the word empower out. I, I think it's a well-intended, but it's very passive. So empowerment means if you want to do something, you have the ability to do it, the power to do it. This is a different thing. This is expectation. It's not optional. Now, of course, different people perform at different levels, just like different sure. servers do. But so it is an expectation that everybody here from the minute they start is 100% responsible for leadership. I don't care if you're 15 two days a week or if you're 79 working two days a week. I mean, it doesn't matter. We're all responsible for leadership and everybody's expected from the beginning to participate in running the business. Do they all? No, of course not. Just like not every bus boy buses the table the way that you asked them to do it. But the expectation is you will be involved. The expectation is that sometimes I'm wrong and the bus boy needs to tell me I'm wrong because guest service is going to suffer if I do the wrong thing. Sometimes the bus boy needs to ask me to help him or her because they can't get to the table and the table needs to be reset so a reservation can get set. And that's what sure. I want. But in a hierarchical setting, they would never ask the owner to do that because they would think they would get in trouble. So how does this play out in practice? Uh, I mean, it's in the statement of beliefs. So that's one place is we're being clear. It's, uh, it's in our systems also. We're open book management. So there's huddles every week in each business. Does everybody go? No, but they could go. And it's very different to opt out than it is to be locked out. Yeah. Right? So this is where we run the business. They see all the numbers. They, their voice matters sometimes more than mine because people will listen to a new employee in some, in a good way, like a new member of the family gets, they're like, Oh, that's so smart. And you're like, I've been saying that for four years, but you keep telling me I'm wrong. <laughs> so, so in a way, the new person's voice might count more because people are more receptive, right? You don't sure. have 10, five, 10 years of you know, baggage to unload. 
um, we all our meetings are open. So I was just this morning, we had our Zingerman's wide huddle. It's kind of weird because it's been on Zoom for the last 18 months instead of in person, but they're open to anybody who comes. We pay them to come. We want them to participate, right? So you could be here three days. You could get paid to come into that meeting. You could raise your hand when we're getting into benefits. And it doesn't mean you're the decision maker necessarily, but your voice still matters. So, and, and then it has to be lived out in practice. I mean, if, if, if we treat people like they don't matter, they're going to act like they don't matter. Huge. And, and then this, the, the kind of conversation that we have, it, with them our beliefs will manifest in this in that conversation so here's a little good anecdote for you so we're now in january back in the i don't know the 93rd surge of the pandemic uh it's hurting sales in the dining rooms uh it sucks would be the technical description so you know it's really slow right and i happen to be in the roadhouse and i don't know about you but my anxiety gets really high when it's slow even though i know it's january and it's the winter and we're in michigan sure. and it's always slow and then i know da, 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 and so when i see people standing around i don't know about you but my anxiety is almost as high as when we can't meet payroll so yeah so i see you know relic some new newer folks and they're kind of leaning on the counter and I'm like, but I've tried to train myself not to yell at them. I need to do something. <laughs> well, because that's completely destructive, unhelpful, and Absolutely. not with our values. So uh, when they when people get hired, they get the statement of beliefs, right? It's a booklet. Looks like that. You have one. So nice guy. I walk over to him, and I'm like, yeah, I said, I'm going to ask him about the statement of beliefs. He's been there for like I don't know three, four weeks what I thought was going to happen because I said, are you, I was going to ask if he had one is he's going to say, no, they didn't give me one because it wouldn't be that weird people to forget. So I ask him ready for the worst. And he goes, Oh yeah, I have it. And I, okay, I'm like, that's cool. It's kind of working. So I said, well, what do you think about it? And I'm kind of thinking like secretly, like he hasn't read it at all. And he goes, it's really interesting. I really like, and this, I mean, he's in high school. He's like, it's really interesting. And I'm like, what did you like about it? He goes, well, it's just so much easier like to know what all this stuff is. And I really like a couple of them really, I really liked how one of them says like, we believe that our job is to help everybody become the best that they can be. And I'm like, oh my God, like it's mind blowing in the best possible way. But then in the ecosystem, like think about, I start to think about like what happens if you start in a workplace like that, imperfect, of course, and you work there for three, four years where you're involved, where you're in conversation, where you're part of the leadership, even if you're only there three days a week, people care what you think versus if you go somewhere else and it's completely the opposite. Sure. Right. And then what beliefs are formed about business screws people over, bosses are bad work sucks versus this is really cool. Like I like being here better than school. <laughs> so I guess all of those things come together and the power of those small conversations is not the main thing, but it does matter. And still like, I'll walk up and ask people like what they think we should do. Like, I don't know, I'm really struggling. I get this employee situation, another part of the organization you've been here a few weeks only but i'm interested because your perspective is fresh what do you think i should do like they don't have to know names like make them think like a leader yeah nd yes you can it's on zingermanspress.com or zingtrain.com we did it for the staff but then people wanted to buy it so we started why not sell it to well in in some some of the vertical integration you have done has come directly out of your employees wanting to, to take that entrepreneurial step through your organization, right? I, I think the bakery is an example of that, right? Yeah. So we, when we wrote that 2009 vision, I, my experience, Paul's experience is that back to the question of real ownership, like you're looking for the money instead of hoping Ari and Paul figure it out and you feel bad for him, uh, is that... <laughs> we wanted an owner on site because I think it's different. And clearly there's highly ineffective owners and there's some awesome managers we know, but as a broad generalization, when the owner is present and they're good at their job, back to your other point, there's a different energy. Completely. 
and, and when I think of almost all the restaurants that I love to go to, it's not the one with all due respect that somebody open because they're famous and it's the 12th unit and they're there for the first three weeks and they come back three times a year to taste the food. Like it's, it's not a judgment. It's just, those aren't my experiences when I go in there. It's fine. If I'm in a city, I don't know when I happen to go there, it's fine. But the, can I say places names? Yeah. Like I'd love to go to La Chicha in San Francisco because they're in there every night. And the husband's the chef and the wife is in the dining room and they're awesome, man. And it's like, they're in there, you know, and I know, you know, Rick Bales, Rick has a lot of places, but he's in the place in a way that they're all in Chicago and he's there. And I, I don't mean that other people can't do a great work to your question. I mean, they're, they're, they're awesome, but I just think there's a difference. So the idea of the vision was to create opportunity for people, uh, not by flipping the company and it like you know we're google and they're all going to get rich from stock shares that's fine but this was a different way which is if you're passionate about i'm sitting at zinc train maggie bayless was passionate about training we got a training business so the business school story of zingerman's is paul and i were so brilliant that we saw the strategic opportunity to sell our training it's like completely not true we we wrote the 2009 vision Right. that said we wanted to open these businesses and there would be managing partners in them. And we had known Maggie from the restaurant. She was a server when I was a line cook. She had gone, she was a German lit major from Oberlin. She had gone back to Michigan, got an MBA, worked at GM for two years, didn't really like it, not shockingly, and ended up taking a job in a small consulting firm where she didn't love the company, but she fell in love with the training design. And right. she really loved training. And as the story goes, she kept going home to her husband going like, why can't I find a business that's like does training and whatever that, you know, runs it like Ari and Paul are running it because she was our friend for all you. And her husband goes, well, didn't they just write that new vision? Like, well, why don't you go talk to them? And she's like, I never would have done it on my own, but together we could create this training business, which now, you know, we have clients all over the world. I mean, we're small, like in, in the best possible way, you know, but we have a relationship with each client and it's wonderful, right? So, so yes, the idea was to help people grow. And the idea really from the beginning is back to this question that's still on the screen is that you're treating everybody like a leader from the minute they get there so that then it's not just, uh, uh, you know, like the, uh, say like in basketball, like they don't teach you the plays when you get into playoffs. Absolutely. Like you, you're, you practice, you practice, you practice. So that leadership thinking is what you're used to so that when the business opens, it's not like you got this, like you already have enough to overwhelm you. <laughs> From For sure. dealing with carbon monoxide alarms and permits and stuff that you never heard of, or at least I never heard of, right? But are important. So if you already are used to managing, thinking like a leader, being creative, working with groups of people collaboratively, it's a thousand times easier. It's not easy, but it's easier. Do you have time for one more question, Ari? I, I'm not going anywhere. I'm, uh, well, I'm going to go pour water, but I'm not in a rush because <laughs> okay. it's January and it's slow and I'll just get stressed out when I get there. That sounds good. Let me let me find one more. I think that's a really good question. And in the Q and A, somebody had asked about this. Um, not not this question. This thing is doing amazing things now. Uh, the question was about marketing your restaurant. How do you market yeah. your restaurant without marketing your restaurant? Well, I didn't go to business school, and I have a marketing degree, so you could take everything with a grain of salt or a really good. Breton gray salt, but take it with a grain of salt. So um, <laughs> I, I guess for me, starting point, everything's marketing. How the host, and you, you talk about this in your show. I mean, the, the, in different people that you interview in different ways will, will answer with this. But uh, I mean, how the host greets the guest is marketing. How the server is marketing. How the plate looks is marketing. How the food tastes is marketing. And, and the energy of the business is marketing uh, because social media gives a technical tool that allows it to go faster, but it's just word of mouth still. Now they figure out how to gain the system so that people can <laughs> buy people to say that they really like it, even if they don't really like it. So there's all these problems coming up, but I mean, essentially, I, for me, marketing starts with believing in what you're doing. 
Uh, and if you believe in what you're doing, then then there's tactical tools to use. Uh, it's not like we we don't run, we run specials pretty regularly. I I prefer to look at them as specials than discounts, although they may amount to the same thing in practice. But you know, blue plate specials on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night. Uh, we've done stuff like if you wore a Zingerman's t-shirt to the deli on Tuesdays, you got a discount. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a million things that can be done uh, that make it fun and engaging and turn it into something special. Uh, I think in the end of the day, the quality of the food and the service drive all of it. But, and I, I don't, I, I've never, like if the only reason people are coming to us is for the discount, it's not a good customer for us because they'll just go right back to not coming. Um, if it's a way to get a good customer or a potentially good customer engaged. So I just look at it like it might tip their decision so that they decide to come to one of our businesses instead of going somewhere else. And then once they drink the coffee at the coffee company and they go to a mass market chain, they're going to have a really different sense of what that is. And they might not even be able to put their finger on why it's different, but they're going to know. And this is my argument back with this ingredient where we're in conversation about, you know, instead of here, let's go to here. I, will the customers say that that's why they come in? No, they're not going to say it. It's in dishes there, you know, but it's, it's in the pepper grinder on the table or whatever. These are like little things. It's the quality of the vanilla bean, right? But it's in there. And when they taste it, it just tastes somehow tastes better. And when they go to the other place, there's just something missing and they can't really tell you what it is. But when they go home, they're like, oh, it was good, but I just, can we just go back over there? Right. In the same way that energy transfers too, because you feel it and you want to be around hopeful people. You want to be around people who are caring, who bring love to work and who, who, who believe in you as a customer, believe in, in their coworkers, et cetera. So it's not necessarily tangible, but in the long run, it transfers into a tangible context because sales go up. <laughs> for sure. Well, I, I think you've also done a masterful job, especially through the newsletter. And for the folks that are, uh, that, that are watching that haven't subscribed to your newsletter, they absolutely must. Um, you've been a content creator and a value generator for years years and years and years I, I mean uh probably the first restaurateur uh that that i came into contact with whose newsletter wasn't really about the restaurant or about them it's about food and it's about culture and it's about ingredients and vendors and sourcing and responsibility and yeah you know the aspiration of every marketer uh is is, is to give value Right. And, and the aspiration of every restaurateur is to convince people to come back. But you, yeah. you have aligned those two things beautifully so that people look forward to your communications. I look forward to your email every week. Well, thank you. Yesterday, to give people context, yesterday I wrote about apologies. Uh, so and why it's such an important piece of our ecosystem, which I really hadn't thought about that much until this last few weeks. But anyway, um, I, well, I think they're the same. You know, I, I, I think. If the food is terrific, but the emotional experience sucks, which is not uncommon, the food better be really yeah, unbelievably yeah. good. And uh, one of the natural laws of business is that success means we get better problems. And we have a good problem. I mean, when we opened in 1982, no one knew what extra, hardly anybody knew what extra virgin olive oil was. Goat cheese was almost unheard of. I mean, I, you know, I don't go to the fast food chains, but they probably have a goat cheese on a burger and they all have croissants <laughs> and, you know, so, and, and in a good way, I mean, the food industry and kudos to the people who do it. I mean, it's, it used to be hard to find a good meal most places. I think now, I mean, honestly, small town, I've been a lot of mid-sized small towns and there's restaurants doing pretty darn good work, man. There's food trucks doing pretty darn good work. There's cafes. I mean, I was, you're from Oklahoma. I was in Oklahoma city a few years ago. I mean, there was like six places with pour over coffee and I'm like, this is great, man. So uh, in a good way, it's less and less hard to find something really great. And that just for me adds not, it doesn't diminish my commitment to the food, but it does 
reinforce why this other stuff is so important because people, I believe you asked about the future and what, what do I know? I only know what I'm doing, but I, I believe people more and more will, that we want to serve the people like that will more and more make decisions on going to places that share their values. 100%. And, and, that, and that the values are manifested in the way we treat. It's not just what's on the plate. It's, it's, it's what, how we treat people. Uh, it's how we treat the guests. It's how we interact with the community. It's the energy in the place. I mean, we wrote about love in our 2032 vision and I take it seriously. And if you would have told me in 1982, I was going to be talking about love <laughs> at work. I would have laughed. I would have laughed you out of the room. Uh, Nicole, there's a, this is a different newsletter and I'll, I'll try to put the link in now. And then these guys will put it in the, uh, in the chat. I mean, the uh, post show notes, but I think I can handle it because I have it here. Well, and that's, and that's the link to the archive. And then there's a drop down on the right side and you can sign up to get it. But, but all of it starts, all of your content started with, with, I believe, a foundational belief that you had something to say that was worth listening to. And I think it's, it's a massive lesson for the restaurateurs listening because I don't care how good your food is. You don't want to compete on food and beverage, not in 2022. You should have great food. You should have great beverages. You should have a unique offering. But someone yeah. will always have something better you know, at a better price point. And, and it's, we, we must give them the one thing that we have that no one else does, which is our beliefs, our values. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you standing out front, you are Zingerman's, right? I would, well, I would everybody's willing, Zingerman's, but yeah. I, but I would bet money, I, Ari, you talk to 10 people on the street and eight of the 10 probably think your last name is Zingerman. They do. And the, the, <laughs> irony, the irony is that Paul is the extrovert and I'm a total introvert. <laughs> right. But the good news is like he, I, I, I stopped going, I don't go to any social events and I don't go to any fundraisers. I'm donating money, but I'm not going, I'd rather wash dishes uh, and <laughs> I'd, I'd rather bust tables. So, uh, and he does all that. So I don't have to, but but yes, it is important. And I, I don't mean you have to be there every minute and every day. I mean, I think that's a fallacy. It's, it's a belief that goes with, it's the old belief of the food business. You sure. have to be there every minute. And it's like, well, yeah, if you treat people badly and they don't like you, <laughs> they don't understand <laughs> how the business works and they don't know what the financials look like. So they think you're a gazillionaire. Then right. Why shouldn't they take some extra stuff home? You know, if they see the financials, it doesn't preclude that there might be theft, but it goes down a lot because everybody's in it together and they all know what happens if somebody's stealing. So it really reduces it. So I, I think these, again, our beliefs and our actions are critical, but the actions follow the beliefs to your point. That's a great place to leave off. All right. Thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to chat with me, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. This is Ari Weinswig, a modern day philosopher and a modern day restaurateur all at the same time. Thank you so much, Ari. I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you, man. Uh, I'm putting my email in there right now and uh, people are welcome to reach out. And uh, Josh, thanks for doing what you do, man. I listen regularly and I learn repeatedly. I, I love you for it, man. Have a great day. Take care, everybody. Come visit.